Hey, welcome to lecture number four. I'm calling this one The Female Body. And we're going to start with the artist Kiki Smith. Um, so this is a portrait that Chuck Close, who we talked about in the previous lecture, did of Kiki Smith in 1993. Uh, so she was born in 1954 in Germany and moved to the United States as a child. Um, she began her career in the 1970s with sculptures, and her first exhibition was in 1984. Um, she was part of the collab collective with uh, Michelle Basquiat, Keith Herring, uh, and Keith Ahern. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, Basquiat most likely later, and possibly Herring too, if we can. Um, so, <laughs> interesting quote here, extremely public and equally mercurial. Smith has a persona somewhere between a monarch, outlaw, and a naif. Uh, so you can decide for your own. I'll post a link to a video that you can watch and you can see a little bit of her personality in action. You can decide in your own if that um, description matches her pretty well. So her father, Tony, was a sculptor and she'll talk about like what the implications of that was in the video that I'm gonna post. A sister or father as a youngster and in the early 1990s, uh, she went through a bunch of tragedies, one after the other. Uh, she lost her art dealer. He died. Uh, she lost her sister to AIDS, and her father also died. So all of these came together to affect her, and she'll talk about it in the video, but it affected her as far as thinking of how we as humans are and how we interact with the world and how there's a certain amount of delicacy in humans so let's look at some of her work and some of her work i warn you can be somewhat disturbing uh and that's intentional so this is called untitled a lot of her pieces are called untitled we'll see a lot of artists do that from 1990 and this one is beeswax and microcrystalline wax figures so she uses these types of materials because they have an organic or flesh-like quality to, quality to them. And she really wants to have that kind of uncanny, visceral type of reaction whenever people see her art. Um, the Whitney Museum of American Art says they hang from metal strands like dry cleaning. So they're streaked with milk and semen. She talks about this in the video about humans, how they're leaky, uh, and sometimes we can be sick, or just merely embarrassed, or just going through normal bodily functions, uh, and we can be leaky. And it's something that she wants to experience, uh, explore in her art. So this one, the Virgin Mary, she says, humans are frail and leaky. Our boundaries are insecure. Things spill out. Um, so this is something that someone can relate to if they, for instance, have a um, chronic medical condition, condition that could lead to these sorts of things. Some of the themes of her work, according to her, are embarrassment, frailty, death, vulnerability, but she also likes to use traditional techniques. So when you see her pieces, they look like sculptures that are shaped like humans, and oftentimes she'll like to use molds that are either on humans themselves, sometimes she'll use herself, as we'll see in the video, uh, or mold sculptures that she makes in a traditional way. So traditional technique, but as you can see from the materials with this one, wax, cheesecloth, and wood, untraditional materials. So Adam says that Kiki Smith ref is refusing to be pretty with her work. And I would agree with that. I think Kiki Smith would agree with it as well. Directs the physical unease that her work generates towards a social understanding of ourselves, according to Arneson. Again, she'll talk about this in the video, but she does a lot of trying to poke at her audience. Um, I didn't mean that as a pun. Um, to poke at her audience and get them to think about themselves and how they relate to the world. So again, some of these are kind of sort of disturbing. Uh, this one's called Tail. Susceptible to the charge that she celebrates victimhood, pain in Smith's work is often a blameless fact. And I think you'll see that in when Kiki Smith again talks in the video. She's not talking about people being a victim. She's just saying that there's certain things that humans have to go through. Like she said, frailty, embarrassment, 
or leaky. So again, somewhat disturbing. This one's called Blood Pool, and it's from 1992. So I'll post a link to the video, and you can check it out and see her at work and see her talk about her work. So I highly recommend doing that. I'll put that in the description to this video. So this one's called Rapture. And she kind of talks about why she is really interested in saint jean uh, Genevieve of Brabant. Um, so like a lot of uh, Christian or Catholic saints, uh, saint jean uh, who is kind of a legendary type person, was a chaste wife who was falsely accused of infidelity. She was sentenced to death and spared by her executioner and she lived in exile, being supported by a roe, which is a baby deer. Um, so the story is kind of like she mixes together this story of saint jean with Little Red Riding Hood um, and showing her emerging out of the kind of husk of the wolf in this case. So again, check out this video. This is a piece that's very similar to the piece that if you ever go to the Detroit Institute of Art, you can see I'm um, talking about aging a little bit with this one from 1990. So Mark Ryden, and I posted a couple of videos for him in the description. Uh, the first one's a time lapse of this particular painting. So you can see how he uses traditional technique with many, many layers to make this kind of what's now called pop surrealist type of view of things. Uh, this one's called the incarnation. <laughs> so definitely not above puns for sure. Uh, and as you'll see in his work, and I'm sure you've already seen people that are influenced by him, he's probably the most influential artist as far as um, the type of art that you'll see out there. Like if you go and follow Instagram artists, especially in the city of Los Angeles, where it seems like everyone is doing this style. He was born in Oregon in 1963, so only 10 years older than me. When he was raised in Southern California, he attended an Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, which is more of a college that doesn't necessarily turn out fine artists, but more uh, is for designers. Um, so it's kind of interesting that he ended up making fine art in a rather traditional style, although the subjects aren't so traditional. So sometimes this is called lowbrow art. And what that means is worth talking about for a moment. The idea is that if someone is outside of the art school system, the art gallery system, um, doing postmodern style arts, like we're going to see a lot of the artists doing, uh, if they do subjects that are more like you would see in like comic books or in pulp magazines, then they'll be called lowbrow. And sometimes that can be a derogatory statement. Other times it's a celebration. Uh, so I'll go with the celebration thing because I think he's a pretty good artist. Um, he started his career making a lot of album covers and one of them was a Michael Jackson uh, album cover. So pretty big, giant uh, way to get started. And he uses traditional techniques as you'll see in this time lapse, you'll see him build up layers and layers of thin paint to be able to make these figures, which are surreal, but he paints them in such a way that you almost could think that they were real. So this one, St. Barbie. So pop surrealists in general uh, tend to look at things that are in our society, kind of like what we saw with the pop artists, uh, and think about the implications of it. And sometimes by using surrealism, like a different world that's close to our world but doesn't seem like it could exist, you could explore these ideas a little bit more clearly. So Ryden forces us to ask questions about our society by placing symbols of our cultural familiarity into unsettling circumstances. So we will have some unsettling art. This one is another example. He was a big fan of a few artists. Uh, one of them, which you probably recognize right away in this, if you're familiar with art, is Hieronymus Bosch, who liked to populate his paintings uh, with all kinds of crazy and wild types of figures that you couldn't imagine. Almost like, even though he's working in the 1500s, uh, Bosch is almost like an early surrealist. He also said he was influenced by Dali, another thing you might recognize. Magritte, someone you might not recognize. Rosenquist, Angre, 
and Davi. So Anga and Davi were both uh, neoclassical slash romantic artists who had a very, very fine paint quality so that you couldn't see the paint itself. So that's the same thing that you'll see with Ryden. You can't see any paint strokes in his paintings. It's almost like he's painting photographs of things that couldn't exist, of course. So this is an example of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. You can see how he has, and I love this word, a phantasmagoria of different figures. This is probably the most more famous part of Bosch's painting. Um, and it shows kind of the people sinning in all these various ways. And you can see how there's all these creatures, uh, some symbols that we would call Freudian nowadays. Uh, and you can see how, but with modern types of iconography, uh, Mark Ryden is kind of exploring a similar way of composing a picture. So Ryden went through a divorce in 2002 and 2003, and he talked about how it affected him. He didn't want to get too down, uh, so he planned the blood show um, around the time that he had the divorce. And with this, he was going to be displaying miniature paintings. You can see the scale of them in this picture, in this red curtain room. And he asked everyone to wear red clothing. Uh, so this older gentleman decided he wasn't going to wear red clothing, but the kids, they followed exactly what you were supposed to do uh, with these pictures. So this is his picture, Rose. And again, I think he uses these figures, which are usually young feminine figures, to express some feelings that he would have or feelings that almost anyone would have. He says, people in our culture think they should never be unhappy. They think being unhappy is unnatural. They try and make it go away. They take pills or go to therapy to fix themselves. They blame themselves or others for their suffering. We need to understand that sadness is as much a part of life as joy. It would be easy to just get bitter and cold while focusing on the dark side, but there is also an amazing, wonderful side of life. If you look for it, there's a true magic all around us. Maybe that sounds trite to the hardened, self-protective, modern ego, but if you open yourself, you do make yourself vulnerable to pain. But the deeper the pain experience, the deeper the joy you can have. So Ryden himself is being very vulnerable here. And I think he does a pretty good summary of the types of work that he did even before his divorce. So this one is Lincoln's Head from 2003. Again, you can imagine some of these like looking at a Dali painting, that it was a very strange dream that you could barely understand the meaning of. He was very fond of getting uh, wood carvers and sculptors to make these very, very fancy frames for some of his paintings. So a good example of the frame going along with the subject of the picture is this one, the allegory of the four elements. So you can follow all of the various symbols of the four elements. They have them right here on the young feminine figures' dresses. And then all of these um, parts of the picture all have a symbol for the various elements. So I, I'll include this link in the description for the video so you can check out the meaning of the allegory if you're interested. Literally everything you see in here, including the animals and the color of the dresses and their hair, uh, are related to the allegory, which means uh, when you make a work of art, whether it's literature or painting, where each part of the work of art has a specific meaning. So this last one, Ghost Girl, again, really working with the frames themselves to be part of the work of art rather than something just to house it. So this is his Tree of Life. His wife, uh, since 2004, is also a painter who developed a similar style at around the same time as Mark Ryden, but separately from him. Her name is Marion Peck. And her and Ryden did this very strange, so I'll just warn you, it's a very strange uh, kind of short story, but stop animation called Sweet Dreams. Um, you might hate me as you watch it, but it's kind of cute and also disturbing at the same time, very much like the rest of Mark Ryan's work. 
So I'll include this link in the description for this video. So Judy Pfaff, I remember the first time I experienced her work, it wasn't on paper like this, but it was like one of the environments that I'm going to show you in a moment. moment. Uh, and I always find it's a really fascinating experience to be able to walk inside of art uh, instead of just look at it in the wall. But she did start developing these ideas, which came out in her environments later, uh, in two dimensions. So she's born in 1946 um, in London, England, which you won't notice when you see the video of her because she has a very, very strong Brooklyn accent now. Uh, she moved to America, New York City, at 13, and she actually got an MFA at Yale. And she'll joke about this in the video a little bit. But she had mentioned how she wasn't very good at school. Uh, so you would think, wow, how'd she end up at Yale? Uh, but there was some artists, she'll talk about Al Held, who believed in her as an artist and said, hey, maybe you don't have the best skills in academic work, but you have really great skills when it comes to art. So she was able to get the MFA and eventually make a career out of art. So this one called Gu Choki Pa from 1985 is kind of similar to the types of ones that I first experienced with her. And you can see all the different materials she has, kind of like the two-dimensional work where you have all kinds of colors and almost things that look like gears and machines and patterns all together at once. It's kind of overwhelming. When you see it in three dimensions all around you, it's even more overwhelming. Judy says, I've been very involved in not having a signature material. <laughs> Indeed. I think there is a signature style. It's like handwriting. And I have a feeling that anybody who's seen much of my work would probably recognize it as mine. But I don't use the same materials. I like having different kinds of input coming in. When I first came to New York, I had no money. Obviously, no one had any money. And I had the year of aluminum foil. I did the year of tiny white structures. Now I get a router or a tool, and it was the year of the router, the year of the jigsaw. So she built this up bit by bit. And, you know, living in New York in the 1980s and 1970s, that was possible to do without a lot of money uh, back then. So this is our NYC BKQE. And again, these kind of, we call these installations uh, whenever you have something you have to build on the site. Uh, so kind of an amazing experience to have these. You almost imagine this one making sounds as well as these the visual cacophony. I think there's always a melancholy in the work. Kind of surprising. Though everyone has always thought of the work as being very happy or jaunty. What's the word I get? An explosion in a glitter factory. Seems appropriate. There's always something that can be seemed carefree, easygoing. I can hardly remember that. I mean, I can have a good time and I can be lighthearted, but there's another quality that will get it, especially with the latest works. And you'll kind of see that since the type of work she makes has always been a lot of hard physical labor, you can understand how her experience of making it may be different than the experience that people have in viewing it. Because I thought it was joyful too when I saw her first works. So check out this video of it's another Art 21 video of Judy Pfaff. You can see her working on one of her more recent pieces. So that's the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it.